to be praised. The Lord is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun. Praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to Divine Healing School. I am so glad that you have chosen to tune in today. And as always, I believe that you're going to receive something from what you hear tonight. And in just a few minutes, we're going to get into some things that are going to, to bless you 
and that's going to enlighten you. And in some respects, you're going to need to fasten your seatbelt because we're going to get into some things that I've not wanted to get into very much. And I don't, I don't get into very much. And I really never talk about when I am doing a healing meeting somewhere, some kind of healing conference or crusade. I don't usually get into some things I'm going to share with you tonight. But this morning, the Lord directed me to do it. And we will do it tonight. But let's pray first. And then we will get into the word. My dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this opportunity to come before you. Thank you for the privilege and honor of gathering around the word to be fed the word of God, to have the Holy Ghost to minister the word unto our spirits. And I thank you personally for the privilege and honor of choosing me to minister the word to your people. I thank you tonight for giving me utterance in the Holy Ghost. Thank you for him leading me, guiding me, directing me, and ordering my words tonight in the name of Jesus. I know what you have said to me this morning, and I absolutely need your help and your wisdom and your direction and guidance in bringing those things out. I thank you, Lord, for people having an open heart and a readiness of mind to receive, because it is only then that you can give people what they need. I thank you for your word. I yield myself now to the Holy Spirit and I say, have your way. Have your way. Cause the words of my mouth and even the thoughts of my mind to be according to your perfect will. In the mighty name of Jesus, and I thank you for it right now. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, hallelujah. Well, lift your Bibles and say with me, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is God speaking to me. His purpose is to bless me, to change me, and to be glorified through my life. Therefore, I set myself in agreement with his word by having a receptive heart and a readiness of mind to receive, and by being a doer of the word I hear and not a hearer only. I realize that obedience to God's word is essential in order to have God's best for my life. Amen. I hope you said that, and I hope you mean it when you say it. Praise God. We've been talking about three main reasons why Christians remain sick or stay sick even after praying or being prayed for. And we gave you two of the reasons Two of the main reasons, which I'll go over quickly. The first reason I gave was uh, one, reason number one why people stay sick even after praying or being prayed for is that they are uncertain about God's will to heal them. And the truth of the matter is people pray all the time, but they are uncertain about whether or not God wants them to have what they're praying for. That's why they close their prayer with 
if it be thy will. They don't know for sure what his will is before they pray. And they pray with an uncertainty about his will. And if you don't know God's will about a matter before you pray, you cannot pray with expectation of receiving the answer. See, a lot of people have the idea, I'm going to pray. And to just leave it up to God. If it's his will, he'll do it. If it's not his will, he won't do it. Well, if you, if you do that, you're going to come up on the short end of the stick because that's not the way it works. It's not a matter of if, if it's God's will, he will do it. And if it's not his will, he won't do it. He knows what's best. And all of these other religious things I hear people say all the time. It's just religious nonsense. You cannot pray in faith. You cannot pray with, with confidence, with an expectation of receiving the answer to your prayer without knowing his will before you pray. And I know that I've had people say, well, you can't, you can't know the will of God. Yes, you can. The word of God reveals the will of God. You cannot separate God's word from his will. If he said it in his word, then it's his will. I heard somebody, I've heard this many years ago, and I've heard it many times over the years. I heard somebody say, you know, the Bible said God will, you know, he'll meet your needs. But it didn't say he'll give you your wants. That's totally, completely unscriptural and untrue. Jesus said, what things ever you desire when you pray, whatever you desire. He did not say, what things soever I desire you to have when you pray. He said, what things ever you desire when you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now James said, you have not because you ask not. And then he said, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. That means when your motivation is wrong, when your motive is contrary to the word, then of course you don't receive. You're asking amiss. You're missing it in your asking because it's contrary to his word and you're doing it with a wrong motive. In that case, of course, you don't receive. But uh, other than that, Jesus said, what things soever you desire. So if your desire lines up with his word, then that's, you don't have a problem. If your motive is right, you don't have a problem. And let me say one other thing on that. It's not just based upon your need. It's not just based upon your need. Let me tell you something. All you have to do is study the life and ministry of Jesus, and you will find Jesus walked by people that had needs. Their need did not draw him. People called on him, and then he stopped to minister to them. He went by, unless the Holy Spirit directly sent him to somebody, like the man at the pool of Bethesda, unless he did that, Jesus went about his business. He did not just walk around looking for people with needs. Because you remember in John 5, at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus went to one man and ministered to him. But the Bible says that there was a multitude of people that had all kinds of issues. And he did not minister to any of them. All of them had a need. So he's not going to just do something because you have a need. You have not 
because you ask not. But you can't ask in faith if you're not sure about his will. You can't ask in faith if you don't know what his will is. That's, that's just the simple truth. And so reason number one, why, one of the main reasons we, that we talk about, we're talking about three main reasons. And the first one, the well, reasons why Christians remain sick after praying or being prayed for. But we're going to get into some heavy stuff in a few minutes here. Uh, is that um, they are uncertain about God's will to heal them. The second thing, uh, the reason number two was, what has been provided by grace must be, not might be, must be accepted by faith which I just said a minute ago can't be done if you're uncertain about his will. It is the grace of God. It is God's grace that's extended to us to receive things from him. You and I don't earn it. I told you not very long ago, somebody asked me this question about, you know, someone in the in the body of Christ, somebody in the church, some saintly mother who loves the Lord, pray and live in clean and holy and all of this, and they pray and, and, and still they don't get healed. And yet you find this other person who's not living like they should, not living clean, doing all kind of things, and, and uh, they're unfaithful to God and all of this, and they get healed. And, and they said to me, they explained that to me. And I told them, healing, divine healing, is not based on a merit system. God is not healing somebody because they were faithful, because they love him, because they pray, because they read their Bible. That's not why he does it. No more than he saves people because uh, they, they've been seeking him and desiring, looking out for him, wanting something to happen. No, that's, that's not the way it is. His grace is extended. God's grace is his unmerited favor. And of course, in some respects, it means more than that. But as, when, it, when it comes to this that we're talking about, it's his unmerited favor. You did not earn it. He gave it to you. Something that God does for you, not because you earned it, not even because you deserve it, but because he wants to do it for you. Something he does for you, despite what you have done and all those other things. Amen. It's his grace. But even when God extends something to us by his grace, it still must be received or accepted by faith. Now, last time I said we were going to go into some passages, and I think we did look in one passage of Scripture. I told you I had ten different places in this, uh, passages of Scripture that we could look at. I wasn't planning to look at all 10 of them. I told you I would look at a few of them. We only got to one of them. But um, I can show you passage after passage after passage where faith was necessary in order for the person to receive what they came to the Lord for. For themselves, for their daughter, for their servant, or whatever it was. They still had to believe. So we don't, but we don't, we're not going to get into those passages tonight because we don't have, first of all, we, I don't want to take all the time for that. We don't have, really have the time for that, to get into all of that because of 
something the Lord spoke to me uh, this morning. But let's go to number three. Reason number three of the main three reasons why Christians remain sick even after praying or being prayed for is this. Many, not all, but many don't obey God and follow his will. Let me tell you something. It matters to God what you do. It matters to God what you do with your life. It matters to God whether or not you obey him. It does matter to him. And you cannot just knowingly, consistently disobey him, refuse to follow what he says, and then think that your prayers are going to be answered. Because, it's, because they're not. They're not. As a matter of fact, I want to take you over here in the scripture, in the psalm. Let's go over here to the psalm. Praise God. Psalm 66. Psalm 66. And 18. With all, now think about something. With all of the promises God gives us about answering his prayer, answering our prayers, listen to what he says here. In Psalm 66, 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Did you get that? If I regard iniquity in my heart, if you're holding things in your heart, unrepented of, unconfessed sin, he won't hear you. The Bible says this is the confidence that we have in him, that he has, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears with us. And if I know that he hears us, or if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. But here it says, he doesn't even hear us. If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I'm holding things in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And there are people who know God's will and refuse to obey his will. Do you know that if you know the will of God, or anything you and I do contrary to the revealed will of God is sin? Do you know that disobedience of God's word is sin? It is. It is sin. It is a sin to disobey God. It is a sin to ignore his word. It is sin to know what he says and, and, and just do whatever you want to do. Over in the uh, 60, in Psalm 69, listen to what it says. Psalm, Psalm 69 and 5 says, O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee. God knows your foolishness. And your sins are not hid from him. You can have the lights off, the shades drawn, stuff unplugged, but he knows everything. He sees everything. You cannot hide. You cannot hide in the closet. You cannot hide under the bed. You can't hide under the covers. You can't hide in the car. You cannot hide. Everything you do, he know it. Everything you think, he knows it. And when you know to do and refuse to do, he knows. He knows what you know. He knows that you know. And he knows that you're refusing to listen to him or obey him. 
And some people will say, they'll even say, I mean, I know better, but I just want to do, you know, I know I'm not supposed to, but. And some people, that's what Jesus, you know, Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The truth of the matter is that in the lives of many who profess to be Christians, Jesus is not their Lord. If he's not controlling your life, he's not your Lord. You can call him your Lord all the time. And you can say to him, oh Lord. But if he's not in control of your life, if you're not following what he said, then he is not your Lord. It's as simple as that. Now I want to I want to talk to you for a few minutes about something that he was dealing with me about. There uh, is a side of healing that I don't really talk about much, especially if I'm doing a healing crusade or conference or something like that. I don't usually get into some things I'm going to talk to you about now. And the reason why I don't do it is because I call it the negative side of healing. But, but um, one, the reason why, as a rule, I haven't done it, as a personal rule, I haven't done it, is because I knew that Satan would use this and take advantage of people who may not be in that, may not be guilty of some of the stuff we're talking about. But he'll put that and he'll convince people that they're doing something that they're not doing. And of course, if he can convince them that they are doing something wrong, that they did something wrong and all this, then they can't have confidence. And if they don't have confidence, it's not going to work for them. But there are some other things that, that we need to look at pertaining to God. There's a such thing. Now, we don't like to look at these things, but there's a such thing as God judging us. Yeah, I'm not talking about at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not talking about at the white throne judgment. I'm not talking about, quote, judgment day. I am talking about God judging you or disciplining you. And he will do that. The Bible says so. Now, I want you to see something. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about communion and the, the, the Lord's, you know, what we call communion, partaking of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to start in the 11th chapter. This is something we read every uh, communion service that we have. I'm going to start chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to start at verse 23. Now fasten your seatbelt because we're going to get into something as we go here. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now listen, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show, it's the, we say the word show, but it's shoe, S-H-E-W. That word actually means proclaim. So, we do proclaim the Lord's death till he come. 
Wherefore, verse 27 says, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. That means in an unworthy manner. And I'm going to talk about that in a second here. Unworthily means in an unworthy manner. Whoever eats this bread and drinks this, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That is, that is some strong stuff. You're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. As, as though you're the one that caused what happened to him. As though you did it. You're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now go on verse 28. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Notice that he's telling you first to examine yourself. To make sure that your heart is right. Your attitude is right. The manner in which you're doing the, receiving the Lord's Supper is right. We'll talk about that in a second, a little further. But let a man examine himself. Check yourself out first. And then, if you know everything is straight, then eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Some people don't care anything about their lives, what they're doing, how they're living, and they go to the communion table and partake of the Lord's Supper. If you're living like the devil, you ain't got no business at the Lord's Supper partaking because you're partaking unworthily. Now, now notice what it says here. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Another way, way of saying it is condemnation. And another way of saying it is judgment to himself. Not deserting the Lord's body. You're not deserting the Lord's body. You're eating and drinking judgment to yourself. Now notice this. For this cause. For what cause? Not discerning the Lord's body worthily. Not, not discerning the Lord's body. Not partaking worthily. For this cause, listen to this, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. What does that mean, sleep? Are dead. Many are dead. Now this is some heavy stuff, but I want you to hear it. Because we're going to talk a little bit about why uh, some people don't get healed. And it's not just the communion, but it's out of being out of the will of God, is living a sinful lifestyle. And it matters. It does matter. It does matter. I could sit here and tell you case after case after case of people that the Lord said, I want you to tell this person this and tell them here's what's coming if they don't change this. I don't know how many people. I can tell you, I can sit here the rest of the night talking about that. Thankfully, in some cases, the people heard and repented. They were in some type of sin. They were continually in, and they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't repent. And so when you don't repent, you bring judgment on yourself. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh, damnation or condemnation or judgment 
unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now I want you to get this again. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now I want you to notice before I go to the next verse, the progression. Paul's writing to the church and he's telling them why they were having some of the issues they were having. Either many were weak and then sickly and many were dead. He said many, not a few of them. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. I heard a pastor this morning uh, talking about something that happened in the church, in his church years ago, or many years ago, and uh, they were in his church. Well, there were two things that happened. Well, well, before I tell you that, I'll come back and tell you that in a minute. Let me, let's go to the next verse, and then I'll, I'll come back. Notice this. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. See, you can judge yourself. You can decide, you know, this is wrong. I judge this as wrong. This is wrong. I know it's wrong. I know I shouldn't be doing it. And I'm going to turn from it. I quit. I'm going to quit doing it. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Listen carefully. But when we are judged, judged by who? By the Lord. How do you know? When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Chastened of the Lord. That means chastised by God. I know this is heavy, but sometimes, and that's why some people don't get healed and die. They're being chastised. Amen. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation or judgment. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Now he's talking about the attitude and all of that. Because people was doing all kinds of things. You can go back and read the whole chapter for yourself later. People were coming. People were drinking and get, you know, getting drunk. Coming to the Lord's table. They were not concerning other people. There were people that needed, but they were coming doing, doing all they wanted to do. I wish I had time to really show you how it used to be. It wasn't like we do today in church. It was really like a, a real meal that they would have. And some would be hungry, and others would be full, and they were not considering the others. So let me go back to tell you about discerning the Lord's body. There's two sides of the discerning the Lord's body that keep people from receiving because they're not discerning. One side of discerning the Lord's body, you have to, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, you have to see this. This is the Lord's body taken into me. Now, I, I not only do I we receive at church, but but I, I make a habit of doing it at home. I don't do it every single day, but I do it often. I do it often at home. And when I'm doing, I do it, my, I get my elements, and I lay them out, and I read the scripture, and I say, thank you, Lord, for your holy word. According to your word, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
And Jesus also said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As I partake, I thank you for the indwelling presence of the Lord Jesus in my body. And as I partake, I say his body in my body. The health of his body in my body. The strength of his body in my body. The perfect soundness and wholeness of his body in my body. And this I do in remembrance of his sacrifice for me. And then I, and I partake. And then I lift the cup also. And when I lift the cup, I say, in remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus. And I partake. See, I'm discerning the Lord's body. But there's another way of discerning the Lord's body. That is recognizing others as members of the body of Christ. If we're saved, we're all a part of one body. There's only one body of Christ. There's many church assemblies, but there's only one body of Christ. And when you mistreat any member of the body of Christ, you're mistreating Christ. If you consider another member of the body of Christ your, your enemy, you're considering Christ your enemy. And this is one of the reasons why some people are in such bad shape and can't receive healing. And they have all kinds of other issues going on. Now let me go back to the what I was going to tell you about what this pastor was saying. There's two different things. He talked about a young man that was in that church. He was a youth pastor. And this youth pastor, I think before I tell you about the youth pastor, I want to, well, I'll, I'll keep telling you now, and then I'll take you over one other thing. This youth pastor was very good at what he did. Got a young, a lot of young people saying he was discipling the young people and all that, but he had a problem. And he had a young, a lot of young girls, and then he started messing around with them and involving them in a lot of sexual activity and he carried on for this for a while and he didn't repent and and uh, you can't just keep sinning and keep sinning and keep sinning and don't repent and think you're not going to be judged he stepped out of what he was supposed to do and got into something he wasn't supposed to do and stayed in it he stayed in it he stayed in it. And no doubt the Lord tried to deal with him. But, uh, but he, he kept doing what he was doing. And he was really popular. The young ladies liked him and all that. And he used to ride a motorcycle. And he had one of those motorcycles. He just about lay down on it. And he was looking, you know, one day he got on there, he was riding. He's going at a fast speed, doing first, he lets it, doing wheelies, where he get up real high speed and lift the bike up. The front end comes up and he's riding, that's what they call a wheelie, and he's riding on the back wheel. Then he lays back down and he was showing off for people. And he's doing that for a while. Then he start. He's leaning forward and he's looking back. Just looking, 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 looking back. Trying to see who's watching, seeing who's watching. And while he's looking back, he ran into, he ran up under a truck he didn't see, a 18-wheeler, and died. 
He died. What happened? Well, well, he, he was judged. He was judged. Now, so you can stop looking at me the way you're looking at me. I'm going to take you over to Revelation, let you see something here in the book of Revelation. What did Jesus say? This is not, this is not coming from me. What did Jesus say about that? Does God judge people like that? Does he? Oh, well, let's see. Let's go to chapter 2 of the book of Revelation. I'm going to pick up where Jesus is talking to these churches. He's sending a letter to these churches through John. We'll pick up in verse 18 of chapter 2. And unto the angel, the angel is the messenger or the pastor of the church. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God. Who's talking? The Son of God. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. What do you want to say to them, Lord? I know your works, and charity, that is your love, and service, and faith, and patience, and your works, and the last the last works to be more than the first notwithstanding now who's talking Jesus I have a few things against you this is Jesus talking to his church I have a few things against you because thou suffered that woman Jezebel there was a woman in that church listen I don't truly believe her name was Jezebel. Jesus called her Jezebel. I think he was called her Jezebel because she was like the Jezebel in the Old Testament. He said, but you suffer that woman Jezebel, keep reading, which calleth herself a prophetess. You know, just because you call yourself something don't mean you are. A whole lot of people call themselves things that they're not. Doesn't mean you are. Some call themselves pastors, but they're not any more pastor than that wall is a pastor. But they call themselves a pastor. But they're not. But Jesus said, you suffer, or in other words, you permit that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, what was she doing? To teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Now notice what he says after that. Behold, I, Jesus, will cast her into a bed. Now in the margin of my Bible, it says a sick bed. I'm going to cast her into a bed of sickness. And them that commit adultery with her. Not only am I going to throw her in a bed of sickness, but those who are living that mess with her, I'm going to throw them in it too. Hey, amen. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. He's not talking about the tribulation period. That means great suffering going to cause them to suffer except they repent of their deeds. Now, wait a minute. Are you holding on to your seat? Hold on. Check this out. And I, Jesus, will kill her children with death. That's what happened to that man on that, that youth pastor. The pastor this one is said, he said his pastor at the time he was not the pastor of that church. But his pastor came over to him and said, There is a case of the Lord killing someone with death because he wouldn't repent. And that's what happened. I gave her a space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. I will cast her into a bed 
That means a bed of sickness. And them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Thank God for his mercy. He gives you time to repent. You don't have forever. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches, why am I going to do it? When I finish do, dealing with these people, all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I'm going to give you according to your works. I'm, I know what's in your heart. And I'm going to give you according to that. Now let me tell you the other thing this pastor was talking about. Now he happened to be the pastor of this particular church and they had a, a husband and wife who was well off, wealthy. In fact, this man, and they, they owned property uh, and um, rental properties and they owned about 200 different rental properties. They were very well off. They were busy in the church doing things. He was a good teacher of the word and, and, and his wife was also a good teacher of the word. They, they taught. They were both good at it. But at some point his wife started getting weak and then sick. Now listen, remember what we read earlier? For this cause many are weak and sickly and many sleep. Notice the progression. It starts off with people just having a lot of weakness. Then, then they get sick. And, and usually when that, this kind of sick was in some cases where they can't, they don't know what's wrong. They can't get an answer. Like in this woman's case I'm about to tell you about. She started getting sick, losing a lot of weight, and she began to shrivel up in so much that she wound up in a wheelchair, shriveled up. She got down to 80 pounds, he said. And because they were well off, they could go to doctor after doctor after doctor. In every hospital, they went to all the top hospitals and saw all the top doctors. And the thing about it is, they couldn't find anything. They didn't know what was wrong. They couldn't find anything wrong. They couldn't find anything wrong with the woman. And they told her. And told her husband. And yet she's shriveling up and dying. And now she's in a wheelchair. And one Sunday morning, the pastor said, her husband brought her in, in the wheelchair she's all shriveled up and said pastor my wife asked me to bring her today so the elders can anoint her with oil and pray over her so that she could be healed according to James 5 remember James 5 14 is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. It also said, confess your faults. That means your sins one to another. And pray one for another that you may be healed. Sometimes confession of your wrongdoing is necessary in order for you to be healed. Although they can empty that bottle of oil on you and nothing happen. They can pour a gallon of oil on you and won't nothing happen except you be oily. So the pastor said, the, the, this, this minister in his church said, Pastor, she wanted you to, she wanted the elders, they had elders in the church to anoint her with oil and pray for her because she'd be just suffering. The pastor immediately got around there and he said he got down in front of her and knelt down to her and he said sister is there any 
uh, unrepented of sin that you're holding, unconfessed sin that you're holding. And immediately, you know, a husband is standing right there with the chair and he's standing behind her. The pastor said immediately he looked at the husband and the husband dropped his head and just looked down at the floor. He said, I knew something was wrong when the husband dropped his head and looked at the floor. And then the woman looked down too. And she finally lifted up her head and she said, yes, there's, there's some unconfessed sin. Uh, he said, he, he said, what is it? She said, my husband did something some time ago and I will never forgive him. The pastor asked her, do you want to die from this wheelchair all shriveled up? Or do you want to repent? All you have to do is forgive him. And people, you need to understand, forgiveness has nothing to do with how you feel. It's a decision. I know I was on this not so many weeks ago. But here, here, we, are, here we are again. Because the Lord wanted me to bring this to you because it's very important. Let me tell you the same story that I just heard this morning. The woman, thank God, repented. When people say, I just can't forgive them because they're so, so egregious what they did to me. Oh, I just can't. I just can't. You better. You better. You better. You better. I, um, years ago, I was talking to a young man. And uh, he, didn't, um, he had an issue uh, with his father. And I said to him, and he wouldn't, he didn't want to, he asked me, he didn't want to get, he didn't get along, some kind of, whatever the problem. In talking with me, I said, oh, I see you want to die early. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. It didn't say honor them if they're the best parents in the world. It didn't say honor them if you like them, if, you, if they respect you and all that. I don't understand that. You know, I grew up a different kind of way. We never grew up demanding respect from our parents. Are you kidding me? We had to show respect, but we ain't demand no respect. If my daddy said something to me that I didn't like, I kept my mouth closed and just didn't like it. He never knew I didn't like it. I didn't mumble, grumble, complain. Tell him, you owe, you got to respect him. Man, you ain't, what are you talking about? This is your father, your mother. You have to honor them. You don't just talk to them any kind of way. The Bible says if you honor your father and mother, be, you, will, you can live long. I talk, I watch some people, how they talk to their parents. I, I just don't say anything to them, but I say to myself, that young person there will never be an old person. They won't be an old person. They'll never be old unless they straighten that mess out. When this woman decided to forgive her husband, it's a decision and not a feeling. When she decided to forgive her husband, after so many months, her weight started coming back and she was healed. It took a little bit of time for her to recover. And she, and she fully recovered and was able to get back into doing what she was doing before because she repented. What did Jesus say about this woman? I'm going to throw in a bed of sickness. I think that's what the Lord did with this woman because she refused to forgive her husband for whatever he did. I don't know what he did. But she refused to forgive. You, you, don't, you can't afford with anybody you can't afford to say, I'll never forgive them. Are you kidding me? You can't afford to say that. Do you want to, do you want to be judged? Do you want to be judged by God? 
just think just think real hard about how you want your life to be you want to live out your days or not you want to live in peace or not Praise God. If we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. The Bible said, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. We had that case with this woman here, with, with, in Revelation. Woman that, call, that he called Jezebel. We had the case that I just told you about. That man that wouldn't judge himself. What, what Jesus said he's going to do uh, with them? He said, I will kill her children. When he said her children, don't think little children. When he, she, he meant those that were following her. Her like she took as spiritual children. I'm going to kill her and her children. They following her. You better be careful who you follow. Well, this is my friend. Don't follow your friend. Your friend might go off. You follow them off, you're going to go off too. Amen. Don't follow your friend. Don't get out of God's will following your friend. And one last thing I'm going to say. I can't understand because this woman here was doing sinful stuff. I can't understand how people... You already, you know you're not well. You're having some issues, physical issues. You've been diagnosed with some bad mess. And you still want to live like the devil. You already got some kind of disease. You got sexually transmitted disease. And you still want to commit fornication. You, all still, want, you still want to mess around. In homosexuality, that's still fornication. That's still sexual immorality. You still want to do it in God's face. Have the devil taken your mind completely? Get right with God. Fall on your face before God. Or Get before God and you say, I know I'm do I've been doing wrong. Forgive me. Forgive me. I want Jesus to be Lord. I don't want to live like this. I'm not going to do it. You have authority to say no to the devil. Amen. I believe I said everything he had on my heart this morning. There are lots more I'm sure I could say, but I think I said what he wanted me to say. So think about it. There are lots of reasons why people don't receive. If you're found in this, check yourself. And by the way, I always think, I, you know, I said this before, but I said I can get people healed if I can get them to be honest and all that. But check yourself and stop lying to yourself about forgiveness. Just because you speak to somebody every once in a while when you see them don't mean you really forgave them. That don't mean you forgave them. Are you trying to, do you avoid them? You want to do everything to keep from run, being around them? Then you still got some issue and you need to fix it. And if you don't, you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged. Let's pray. My Father, I thank you. Hard things are said, tough things, but all true. And I've delivered the word that you told me to deliver to your people. And I trust the Holy Ghost to minister to them and help people. Not everybody that, that heard this fell under, was guilty of the things we talked about, but there were 
those that are. And may you help them to uh, get it right. May you take away their rest until they just trouble them in, in, the, in, in their think in their hearts. Deal with them over and over again. Say, you need to get that right. You need to fix that. By your mercy. By your mercy. When people realize that when people find out they don't they're not they can't have peace, they're not at peace. Things are not well. No matter what they do, no matter how they pray, you know. It'll make them take notice. Who am I to give you counsel, Lord? You know better than I do what to do and how to do it. And so have your way and move by your power and your spirit. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Praise God. Well, folks, come back again next week. And uh, we'll, we'll do whatever the Lord say. Praise God. Next week, same time, 7 o'clock. Amen. We're continuing with Divine Healing School until the Lord say we're done. God bless you.